This is the second of a two-part lecture series on sociocultural materialism, a macro-sociological theory that views society as a system and looks at the relationships of the various parts of that system to one another and to the social whole. The first lecture dealt with the universal structure of society. This lecture examines the dynamics of the sociocultural system. As promised in the last lecture, we begin with the diagram. As can be seen, the component parts of the universal structure, as outlined in the last lecture, are depicted with the infrastructure at the foundation of the system. But here, our focus will be upon the dynamics of the system as depicted by the arrows in the diagram. As always, we begin with the infrastructure. Throughout history, both productive and reproductive forces have expanded. This is, expansion has been especially rapid in the last 200 years. Natural population growth puts pressure on social systems to expand their productive capacities. As these capacities expand, more children are able to survive, thus putting further pressure on expanding production. While the process is not smooth, moving in fits and starts, there is a long-term tendency for the infrastructure to intensify, that is, to invest more energy into production processes for these processes to become more complex in technology and the division of labor, and consequently for population to grow and become more diverse. In the years since the initial Industrial Revolution, the infrastructure has been intensifying in an exponential manner. Exponential growth tends to be very rapid growth indeed. This has put tremendous strain on the environment in terms of depletion and pollution, and as we will see, it puts tremendous strain on other parts of the sociocultural system as well. During normal times, the intensification process leads to greater productivity and population growth. However, intensification inevitably leads to environmental depletion and consequent pollution. When this happens, societies must, e must either find a new resource base to exploit or collapse. Great transitions in human societies, transitions that involve a shift in the mode of production, say from hunting and gathering to production based on horticulture, are an outgrowth of this intensification process. For the intensification of infrastructure inevitably leads to environmental depletion resulting in either the sudden collapse of the sociocultural system, Easter Island for example, or a shift to a new mode of production. If a culture successfully shifts to a new mode of production, the intensification process begins again. Throughout history, the intensification of production has always been toward greater complexity because the process leads to the exploitation of less available, harder to reach sources of energy. We always use the easily exploited resources first. Similarly, when environmental depletion is reached, the shift to a new mode of production represent, represents a move from a readily available source, say wood, to a less accessible source, coal, oil, or nuclear fission. Over the course of social evolution, Mankind has had to engage in more and more complicated production and pro uh, processing techniques in order to draw needed energy out of the environment. The intensification of production and population has impact upon social structures of societies. Max Weber rooted bureaucratic growth in the increasing complexities of production processes as well as the growth in population size and diversity. A modern automobile corporation, for example, must coordinate the activities of thousands of employees, suppliers, and dealers around the globe. More complex technologies and markets require rational social organization for coordination and control and regulation of these activities. One of the fundamental reasons behind the emergence and growth of bureaucracies 
is that they enable large-scale tasks to be performed. Greater numbers of people require rational social organization for the coordination and regulation of, di of their diverse activities. The world has experienced exponential growth in population, especially over the last two centuries. As population has increased, formal organizations have developed to solve problems of adapting to the environment, government and corporations, handling survival needs, sanitation and food production, and providing social services, welfare and medical care. The third factor behind the growth of bureaucracies is the decline in the size, influence, and importance of primary group organizations. Industrial society requires an extremely mobile population. People must move from one end of the country to the other in order to engage in their occupations. Bureaucratic industrial society requires a social mobility as well. This weakens many traditional groups such as the family and the community. In a more traditional society, these groups provide many services to the individual. Child care, social security, financial aid, education, medical care, counseling, wealth of other services. With the decline of primary groups, many secondary organizations have arisen in industrial society to provide the services that used to be performed by these groups. Rationalization, according to Weber, is goal-oriented rational thought that is based on observation and human reason as opposed to actions based on emotions, traditions, or values. When confronted with a goal, rational thought guides us to choose the most efficient means to attain that goal. Weber, Weber believed that of the four basic motivators of human behavior, formal rationality, emotions, traditions, and values, rationality was becoming more and more dominant in the West. He did not attribute this evolution to simple chance mystical or spiritual reasoning. Rather, he attributed rationalization to the changes in material conditions, such as the intensification of the production processes, population growth, and the consequent growth of bureaucracy, all of which promote goal-oriented rationality. True to his systemic thinking, however, Weber does not leave it there. Because of continuing intensification of production, population growth, and an ever more detailed division of labor, formal bureaucratic organization grows and rationalization becomes more and more the dominant mode of thought in the West, and through the West, the world. People increasingly see their world in terms of rationalization. When confronted with problems of production or reproduction, the tendency is to increasingly to rely upon goal-oriented rationality for solutions, as opposed to tradition, emotions, or value-oriented rationality. When confronted with problems of human organization, we attempt to solve these problems through bureaucracy, the application of rational thought to human organization without much consideration for traditions, values, or emotions. Rationalization, or the application of observation, logic, and experience to achieve specific goals, is now our characteristic mode of thought, our characteristic mode of adapting to the natural and social world. The rationalization and bureaucratization process thus give positive feedback to further intensification. To sum up the dynamics of the system, intensification of production through mechanization and the division of labor and the resulting population growth caused the bureaucratization of structure and the weakening of primary groups, both of which lead to the increasing dominance of formal rationality or goal-oriented thinking to the application of logic and observation. This growth in, of rationality, in turn, promotes further bureaucratization 
and intensification, which in turn promotes further rationalization. This characteristic mode of adaptation has significant impact throughout the sociocultural system as well as on individuals who make up that system. Infrastructural conditions are the primary causes of a society's basic patterns of interpersonal behavior. And these behavioral patterns in turn call forth specific patterns of thought that justify and interpret behavioral realities. Ideas therefore find their origin in the concrete behavior patterns systematically engaged in by members of a society. And these patterns of behavior originate in conjunction with infrastructural conditions whereby people solve the basic problems of human existence. Ideas, of course, interact with material conditions. They promote them, dampen them, affect them, but ideas arise and spread to individuals because they have a natural affinity for people who have similar material interests. Material materialist approach is a means of explaining both social stability and change. Changes in modes of thinking ordinarily depend on prior changes in patterns of behavior, and these later changes are themselves largely products of prior infrastructural change. The materialist approach directs the investigator to begin to search for causes of sociocultural phenomena with the examination of infrastructural conditions. It is likely that these conditions will provide the key to explaining the phenomenon in question. If a diligent search to reveal the causal impact of infrastructural factors fails, an investigator then turns to the examination of structural conditions, then going to superstructure. Infrastructural and environmental relationships are central in explaining sociocultural change. But we also recognize the importance of structures and superstructures in determining the speed and character of change. There are two ways in which a materialist approach to social life can be shown to be preferable to any of the other theoretical alternatives. One way is to submit the materialist strategy to empirical testing against a wide range of sociocultural differences and similarities. Such rigorous testing has been carried out and it works. The other, the other test is through logical grounds. Infrastructural variables take priority because they constitute the fundamental means whereby humans, be, humans solve the most basic problems of human existence. Before humans can formulate marriage rules, organize political systems, construct abstract religions, they must organize the means whereby they will survive. Since it, since it is through the infrastructure that society survives, all widespread structural and superstructural patterns must be compatible with infrastructural practices. But it is not the simple calculation of the greatest good for the greatest number. Many changes are more satisfying to some members of society than to others. Infrastructural change that enhance the position of elite are likely to be amplifi amplified and propagated throughout the system. Sociocultural materialism is in agreement with Marx when he states the ideas of the ruling class in each epoch are the ruling ideas. The elite are able to impose direct economic and political sanctions to get their way. They encourage ideas and ideologies favorable to their position. But the amount of power and control exercised by elite varies across society and through time. Societies are very stable systems and change does not come easily. 
system maintaining negative feedback is capable of deflecting, dampening, or extinguishing most system change. The result of negative feedback is either the extinction of the innovation or slight compensatory changes that pr pr preserve the fundamental character of the whole system. But there are times when change is rapid and fundamental, revolutionary in character. In general, sociocultural change that release more energies from the environment or that enhances the power and authority of a society's elite is likely to be swiftly adapted. This concludes the lecture on the dynamics of sociocultural materialism. For further information of the perspective, I encourage you to read Marvin Harris, uh, to, to download a free copy of my book, uh, Sociocultural Systems, Principles of Structure and Change. Uh, just Google Athabasca University Press and click on the free PDF version of the work. Or better yet, buy it in paperback form. I thank you for your kind and considerate attention.